Live from ABC7, this is Eyewitness News at 8 p.m. on LA56. A scare at LAX when a passenger is thought to possibly have Ebola. We're live with reaction from others who are on the plane. The scare comes as we learn the uh, nurse treating the Ebola patient in Texas has contracted the disease. Caught on camera, a male thief in Orange County. Now police are asking for help in identifying the suspect. Good evening, I'm Jory Rand. I'm Giovanna Lada. Welcome to Eyewitness News on LA 56. An Ebola scare at LAX. A United Airlines flight arriving from New York had to be diverted to a remote gate. A passenger on board became violently ill, but public health officials have since determined there was no Ebola threat. Eyewitness News reporter Amy Powell is live at LAX where she spoke to passengers. Amy. And Giovanna, this passenger's illness raised a lot of fears about the Ebola virus, but in the end, officials say there was no cause for concern. Now, the United Airlines Flight 703 was diverted to a remote runway area after landing at LAX around 2 this afternoon. The flight took to the National Airport. During the flight, a woman on the plane became ill with symptoms. The crew alerted officials on the ground, and the airport initiated its emergency response. Fire department personnel and airport officers from the Los Angeles County Health Department arrived to assess the situation. A photo sent to Eyewitness News by travelers show emergency vehicles next to the plane on the tarmac and fire department personnel putting on hazmat suits. Authorities questioned the sick passenger and determined she was exhibiting symptoms of motion sickness. She told them she had been to Africa recently but was not was in South Africa, not is the of an Ebola. Help. When we landed, we pulled into the domestic terminal. We're told we were moving to the international terminal. Then we were pulled to the way west end of the tarmac where we sat for two and a half hours. Were you scared at all? No. No, the mood on the whole plane was actually pretty light. I mean, everybody was very calm. The attendant, the pilot, and it was just a matter of being patient and waiting. So that's all you could do. You can't get mad at anybody for the situation. Just glad that they were being cautious. We have been... Uh, through a series of training, dealing with a lot of different issues, including this this, uh, this type of a scare, as to how we would uh, respond together, what our protocols would be, and it worked uh, it worked well today. Uh, the passengers were eventually bused to the United Terminal and released to go on to their destinations. Uh, as far as the woman who was ill, she declined transport to the hospital, and officials said again that since she posed no threat, no risk for Ebola. They did not require her to be hospitalized. So once again, back here live at LAX, things are back to normal at this hour. And once again, authorities say there is no threat here, no public health concerns regarding the possible Ebola virus. Reporting live at LAX, Amy Powell, ABC7 Eyewitness News. All good news there tonight, Amy. Thank you. Meantime, it is what health officials feared most. There's another case of Ebola at the Dallas hospital where the first U.S. victim died last week. Eyewitness News reporter Leanne Suter has the latest. Texas nurse at this Dallas hospital now infected with Ebola was one of the staff treating Thomas Eric Duncan, who died of the disease on Wednesday. She identified symptoms immediately on their onset. She was isolated promptly. Officials from Texas Health Presbyterian Hospital say the nurse wore full protective gear when caring for Duncan. The CDC says the infection, though, shows there was a breach in protocol and is now scrambling to figure out what happened. Even though officials say there is no risk to the community, a reverse 911 call went out alerting the nurse's neighbors. A healthcare worker who lives in your area has tested positive for the Ebola virus. Hazmat crews rushed to decontaminate her car, home, and apartment complex. I was so freaked out. Here in Southern California, two potential Ebola patients who have been rushed to area hospitals both tested negative. As emergency personnel, hospitals and doctor's offices practice their safety protocols, health officials are urging the public not to panic. They say the vast majority are not at risk of getting Ebola, which is spread through the direct contact of bodily fluids. I don't think if you're in Los Angeles that you're at high risk of getting Ebola. However, if you were in contact with somebody who has had travel to West Africa or had been in contact with someone who had been diagnosed with Ebola, then the risk is quite high. That risk is why dozens of nurses rallied today in Oakland, demanding better education and more training for those on the front lines of treating Ebola patients. We would like to make sure that there is optimal personal protection. As President Obama was briefed 
on the first transmission of Ebola ever in the U.S. The CDC is urgently investigating, worried that other caregivers at the Texas hospital may have also been exposed. Unfortunately, it is possible in the coming days that we will see additional cases of Ebola. This is because the health care workers who cared for this individual may have had a breach of the same nature. Another health care worker at that hospital is now in isolation as a precaution. Officials say the other 48 people believed to have had contact with Duncan remain under observation, but so far have shown no symptoms. In the newsroom, Leanne Suter, ABC 7 Eyewitness News. Thank you, Leanne. For the very latest developments on the Ebola scare or any breaking news, you can stay on top of it all with the ABC7 app. You'll also get all the latest updates no matter where you are. Just download our free Eyewitness News app to your mobile device. New here at 8, a dog named Spartacus is on the mend after being viciously stabbed. A warning, some viewers may find this video disturbing. Spartacus, also known as Sparky, suffered several knife wounds but miraculously survived thanks to the swift action of the Ghetto Rescue Foundation and the veterinarians at the Pet Care Center. Sparky underwent a two-hour surgery and received over 1,000 stitches. A hospital spokesperson says animal cruelty is not uncommon in the area. We see in this neighborhood, we see a lot of, a lot of, I mean, we have a, a lot of great people in this neighborhood that love their animals. Uh, and then we see some people that just are, shouldn't be on the street, period. Look at that. The Animal Cruelty Task Force has identified a suspect and is investigating the case. Good to see Sparky made it. Two victims are hospitalized and two gunmen still on the run tonight after a double shooting in South L.A. The shots were fired near the intersection of 115th Street and Budlong Avenue just before 1.30 this morning. Two men were treated by paramedics at the scene and taken to the hospital. Their injuries are said to be non-life-threatening. Investigators are searching for two suspects who took off in an older model white car. They say it's unclear if it is gang-related. One person has been killed and two others injured after being struck by an Amtrak train in Santa Barbara. Authorities say the victims were taking photos on a trestle between Refugio State Beach and Gaviota State Park around sunset. As the train was approaching, they tried to run off, but the train caught up with them. A woman was thrown onto the side of a hill and died at the scene. A man and another woman suffered moderate injuries. A fourth man was able to escape unharmed. And a terrifying crash in Buena Park. Eyewitness News viewers sent us this video of a crash at Stanton and La Palma. Look at that picture. It happened at about 1.30 this afternoon. At least five vehicles were involved, but amazingly only one person was hurt and transported to a local hospital. No word yet on their condition. A transient was arrested today for allegedly assaulting a real estate agent as she opened a lockbox in Laguna Niguel. Deputies caught up with John Thomas Glenn this morning. The 23-year-old is accused of approaching a 55-year-old woman yesterday afternoon, putting her in a chokehold and punching her several times, nearly knocking her unconscious. A neighbor heard the commotion and came to the rescue. Glenn took off but was later located and arrested. Investigators say he admitted to being under the influence of drugs and was attempting to get into the home to commit a theft. Police in Yorba Linda are asking for the public's help in identifying a woman who was caught on video stealing mail. The woman is seen on surveillance video walking up to a home and taking a large envelope from the doorstep. The victim reported his UPS delivered credit card was stolen. Two more images show the woman walking up to the home and then leaving the property. Investigators have posted the video on social media in hopes the public will share it with their neighbors or provide additional information. Anyone with information is urged to contact the Orange County Sheriff's Department at 714-647-7000. Joy? Three swimmers had to be rescued from a cave in San Diego. They became trapped in a cave known as Pappy's Point Cove off Sunset Cliffs at Ocean Beach. The swimmers jumped into the water and got trapped in the cave after large waves began to hit them. Lifeguards say they were up against the rocks and the only way out was up a steep cliff. They say one swimmer became so exhausted he was going into a state of shock. The swimmers had to be hoisted up by a rescue rig. All of them are expected to be okay. A cool down and maybe even some rain. Here's Danny Romero with the first check of your forecast. All right, thank you very much, Giovanna and Jory. Yeah, I'll tell you what, that is that coolness is coming on the way, but there's still another day of some heat in the way of that. First, look at Burbank here on a Sunday night. 
things are fairly clear in the valley. The temps are cooling down somewhat. We're looking at lower 70s, 71 for Ontario, a 70 for Riverside and Santa Ana. Fullerton checks in 69 degrees right now. Clouds moving in on the coastal spots. We're going to see some overnight clouds and fog on the beaches. So right now, 67 in Santa Monica, showing a 69 in Long Beach and a 67 at Oxnard. I expect those clouds to come in, give us a partly cloudy night, 64 for the overnight low. And then another hot day again tomorrow. But then, as Giovanna mentioned, a real change and possibly even some precipitation. I'll tell you about that when I come back with a seven-day forecast in just a bit. Jory, Giovanna, go ahead. Wow, Danny, could it be? Could be. We'll see. Turning now to the fight against ISIS. America's highest ranking military officer has acknowledged that a new round of U.S. airstrikes has failed to stop militants from advancing. Now they are changing the way they fight. ABC's Alex Marquardt has the latest. Tonight, the northern Syrian city of Kobani is surrounded by ISIS militants who have now battled their way in. U.S. officials warning its capture could be imminent. Over 200,000 residents have fled across the border into Turkey. The U.N. has warned of a possible massacre of those who remain. Some 50 U.S.-led airstrikes against ISIS positions in the past week have failed to stop their advance. And Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Martin Dempsey, acknowledged in an interview with ABC's Martha Raddatz that ISIS is now changing tactics. The enemy adapts and, and they'll be harder to target. Yeah, They know how. Uh, to maneuver and how to use populations and concealment. The general also revealed today that ISIS in Iraq had come within 15 miles of Baghdad's airport. So close that the U.S. had to call in Apache attack helicopters for the first time. That was ABC's Alex Marquardt reporting. General Dempsey says there are no immediate plans for U.S. ground troops in Iraq, but says the role of military advisors in the country may have to evolve with the fighting. Another deadly day in Iraq as the bloody battle between Iraqi forces and the Islamic State group intensifies. At least 58 people were killed today in a triple suicide bombing. Just yesterday, at least 45 people were killed in a series of car bombings in Baghdad. Hundreds of others have been injured. The group behind the attacks seized a third of the country in a lightning offensive earlier this year. It's Iraq's greatest challenge since the 2011 withdrawal of U.S. troops. Well, coming up on Eyewitness News, a tropical storm is gaining speed and is headed towards the East Coast. We'll tell you what to expect. And we'll have the latest on that deadly wildfire burning in Yosemite National Park. Plus, thousands took to the streets of West Hollywood today to, the, to support a great cause. We'll take you to this year's Aid Walk LA.
Firefighters are making significant progress in the fight against a deadly fire at Yosemite National Park. Right now, the fire is 95% contained, and crews have reopened Highway 140, leading visitors into the park's main valley. An air tanker pilot fighting the fire died last week. The fire broke out Tuesday after hot metal fragments from a vehicle created sparks. Hurricane Faye toppled utility poles and knocked out power to thousands in Bermuda today before moving out over open ocean. According to the U.S. National Hurricane Center, Faye is not expected to maintain its hurricane status for long. Farther south, though, a new storm is racing towards the eastern rim of the Caribbean. Tropical Storm Gonzalo is moving toward Puerto Rico, but is expected to stay away from the east coast of the U.S. Danny Romero joining us, and here at home, we yeah. might get a little moisture. Yeah, finally, a little, some coolness, mm -hmm. some moisture, some clouds moving in. One more day, though, of some real heat over Southern California, and that'll be tomorrow. After that, then things change a little bit, a little hint of fall. Let's go outside and get a hint of a Sunday night. And for that, we turn that HD camera right there, looking live and cloudy in Long Beach. And Long Beach shows... Uh, the clouds, the marine layer is coming in, and that marine layer is going to give us some of that cool down in the coastal spots. And as it moves to the coastal spots, we'll see how things are going to look through tonight and into tomorrow morning. Downtown skies, equally cloudy, partly cloudy right now, more so as the night and morning hours move on. 69 degrees right now. It's just variable winds at 3 miles per hour and relative humidity, 78%. As far as our temps today, 79 is the average temp. We're starting to cool down somewhat, some real fall-like numbers. But today, a little bit warmer at 81. Warmer still tomorrow for this afternoon high. We'll see our sunrise tomorrow at 6.57 and get it going. The warmth all around SoCal. We're still under this ridge of high pressure. We move it forward now, Sunday into Monday and Tuesday. Watch now as that ridge starts to break down, flatten out. What's going to happen now, Tuesday into Wednesday, the next major, major weather maker for us will be this low, this trough of low pressure that's going to drop in to Southern California, bringing us the stronger onshore flow. That's the moisture we're talking about. And with that moisture, about a 20% chance of some scattered showers. No heavy rain, but certainly light rain enough chances of that on the coastal and valley spots Tuesday into Wednesday. After that, a little bump up in numbers again, but we're looking at somewhat milder days ahead of us after tomorrow. Tonight, down to 52 in Apple Valley, 56 in Thousand Oaks, Lancaster, down to 48. Tomorrow, the afternoon highs. Here's some of that heat inland, 80, uh, 93 for Santa Clarita, 89 Simi Valley. And the beaches start out cloudy, but eventually get warm enough to 79 at Redondo. Same for Huntington Beach. And the Inland Empire will be a warm low 90s, Elsinore 92, Riverside at 93. Here we go. Watch the changes on the seven-day power back. You weather the clouds, the beaches tomorrow morning. Warmer afternoon than today at 89 downtown. Then look at this drop in numbers. Down to 77 Tuesday, and then that chance of rain Tuesday night into Wednesday. And then that marine layer sticks around into the weekend, keeping temperatures right about where they should be. That 78, 79 range right into Saturday and Sunday. A little bump up to 80 degrees. The Valley's Inland Empire will be hot tomorrow in the 90s. Dropping down quickly to the 80s on Tuesday, more so with that rain chance on Wednesday with a little bit of warming right back up Thursday, Friday into the weekend. We go back to the low 80s. Mountains will be cool, real fall-like numbers through the week. 60s for the highs, overnight lows showing you averages in the 40s. Many areas will get to the 30s, so some cold bundle-up kind of nights coming our way. The high desert, sunny day tomorrow, we'll go 86. And then there, too, the numbers start to drop down from 83 down to the 70s and hold there Wednesday and Thursday. And then as we head towards the weekend, just a little bump back up, but staying in the low 80s, sunny conditions and on the breezy to windy side by next Saturday and Sunday. So get the little umbrellas out and allow mm -hmm. some time for the drive Tuesday okay. night, Wednesday morning. Right. Okay, Danny, thank you for your heads up. Yep. Some 25,000 people hit the pavement in West Hollywood today for a great cause. ABC7 was the proud sponsor of this event. It was the 30th annual AIDS Walk Los Angeles. Eyewitness News reporter Dasha Phillips was there for the huge fundraiser that helps those living with incurable diseases. The 30th annual AIDS Walk Los Angeles drew tens of thousands of people, all pumped up, to raise money and awareness about HIV and AIDS. Some people are walking for people they've lost. Some people are walking for people they know that are struggling with the disease. And a lot of people are walking so that they can, we can have a new generation that doesn't know HIV at all. ABC7 was the grand media sponsor of the event. Team ABC7 participated proudly. People's lives will be saved. People's lives will be better because of what everybody's doing this morning. We can't ever forget that. And our very own Ellen Leva was mistress of ceremony. There are 1.1 million people living with an HIV infection in the United States. And one in six 
folks don't even know they have the infection. So it provides dental service, health care, food, housing, you name it. AIDS Walk Los Angeles raises money for 21 area organizations that supply services to those living with HIV and AIDS. This year, AIDS Walk Los Angeles drew tens of thousands of people and also a lot of celebrities who woke up early to support the cause. We had to work on prevention first. We work on prevention, then we're not going to have to work on getting sick people better. But there was a time when they were struggling to raise a million dollars to fight this. Um, it it, it kind of it kind of breaks my heart. Things like this, where people living with HIV or AIDS can see there's a whole world out there that supports them, um, and it's not a bad word. It's just something that we have to um, address and face head on. Also at the walk, Marsha Miller. She has participated in every single AIDS Walk Los Angeles. Miller says she is proud of how far the event has come, but says she knows there is still a long way to go. I want this epidemic to end, and I see that these walks are helping that. In West Hollywood, I'm Darsha Phillips, ABC 7 Eyewitness News. Great day out there today, and more than 1,300 walkers hit the streets of Laverne today to defeat ALS, the horrific disease that's gained attention recently due to the Ice Bucket Challenge. They participated in the 11th annual Inland Empire Walk to defeat ALS, also known as Lou Gehrig's disease. 100 teams comp uh, completed the two-mile course. By the start of the walk, they had already collected more than $100,000 with a total goal of raising $130,000. Our own Inland Empire Bureau reporter Leticia Juarez served as the master of ceremonies. Coming up on Eyewitness News, a car recall to tell you about. This one involving a faulty seatbelt mechanism. And police are looking for a driver who hit this hydrant, creating quite a water spout. We've got the details. Plus, we'll show you some new surveillance video of the culprits who smoke bombed the Manhattan restaurant when we come back. Welcome back in South L.A. Police are looking for the driver of this 2007 Jeep Laredo. According to investigators, the driver ran into a hydrant shortly before midnight near the corner of Denker and 83rd Street. 
The DWP spent the night trying to turn the water off. No one else was injured in the crash. Police have not released any information about the suspect. Acura is recalling some 43,000 vehicles due to a faulty seatbelt mechanism. The recall applies to the 2014 RLX and the 2014 and 2015 MDX models. The carmaker says the two front seat belts uh, may not release in temperatures below zero degrees Fahrenheit, though so far no injuries have been reported due to this particular issue. Acura plans to mail notices to vehicle owners later this month. New York City police have released surveillance video in the hopes of catching the culprit who smoke bombed a Manhattan restaurant. Take a look at this. About 20 people were eating Friday night when the suspect is seen popping out of a subway grate and tossing two smoke bombs at outdoor diners before taking off. No one was hurt here, but some customers, including actress Rose McGowan, were shaking up, shaken up. She tweeted, quote, someone just threw two red smoke bombs into the restaurant I was eating in. Eyes are burning. Hashtag NYC. What? Mm. We're updating. What? what was that? That will make you say what? Oh, yeah. What's going on? We are updating our top stories at 8.30, including the latest on the Ebola outbreak. This as new details emerge about the Ebola scare at LAX today. And a scary scene after a man falls seven floors from his balcony in Koreatown. Plus, frightening moments at a Halloween festival when two toddlers became trapped in a bounce house that was not properly tied down. Live from ABC7, this is Eyewitness News at 8.30 p.m. on LA56. Our top story at 8.30, an Ebola scare at LAX. I'm Giovanna Lotta. I'm Jory Rand. This is Eyewitness News at 8.30 on LA56. A woman with flu-like symptoms was on a plane 
from JFK arriving at LAX, the flight was diverted to a remote gate out of concern over possible Ebola exposure. Public health officials determined there was no threat. The passengers were then bused to another terminal. Firefighters say the sick passenger had been to South Africa, not the area of Western Africa where the Ebola virus has killed thousands. They say she was simply experiencing motion sickness. Meantime, there is another confirmed case of Ebola at the Dallas hospital where the first U.S. victim died last week. ABC's Marcy Gonzalez is in Texas with the latest. At this hospital in Dallas, another Ebola case. A healthcare worker who treated the patient who died from the virus here last week now infected. She identified symptoms immediately on their onset. She was isolated promptly. Officials from Texas Health Presbyterian Hospital saying the worker followed CDC guidelines, including wearing full protective gear while caring for Thomas Eric Duncan. But the CDC's director says the infection shows there was a breach in protocol. They're now urgently trying to figure out how this happened. We're very concerned. Officials saying there is no risk to the community, but sending out a reverse 911 call to alert the health care worker's neighbors. Health care worker who lives in your area has tested positive for the Ebola virus. While hazmat crews rushed to decontaminate her car, home, and apartment complex. I was so freaked out. As President Obama was briefed on this first transmission of Ebola ever in the U.S., the CDC says they are investigating and offering more training to the staff at this hospital, adding that they are prepared for the possibility of more cases here. Unfortunately, it is possible in the coming days that we will see additional cases of Ebola. This is because the health care workers who cared for this individual may have had a breach of the same nature. And we're told one of the nurse's close contacts is now in isolation as a precaution. Meanwhile, the 48 people believed to have had contact with the first patient, Thomas Eric Duncan, before he was hospitalized, are still being monitored and we're told still have not shown any symptoms. Marcy Gonzalez, ABC News, Dallas. In Koreatown, a man is dead after falling from a seventh floor balcony this morning. Police say it happened around 2.30 on the 600 block of South Hobart. They say a call came in from a driver who had run over the body. The 25-year-old victim had apparently slipped off the balcony, falling to his death. The driver is not considered a suspect in the case. Investigators are simply calling it an accident. Three people who called police to report a, or an alleged kidnapping end up under arrest for murder. Gardena police arrested 36-year-old Jennifer Nichols, 23-year-old Alejandro Terrazas, and a 15-year-old. They say one of the three called Friday night claiming that 34-year-old Bradley Hayes of Hesperia had tried to kidnap them. They told police they were able to knock him out and that he was unconscious in their truck. Paramedics pronounced Hayes dead at the scene. Police say they later ruled out kidnapping and arrested the three suspects on suspicion of murder. A three-car crash involving a CHP patrol unit injured two people this morning in Compton. Authorities say the crash happened around 3.30. The dark-colored Pontiac ended up crashing into a phone booth, which stopped it from damaging a restaurant wall just inches away. The two people inside the Pontiac were transported to a local hospital with non-life-threatening injuries. The two officers in the patrol car suffered minor injuries, but they were not hospitalized. The cause of the crash is under investigation. A public memorial service will be held tomorrow evening for Bell Gardens Mayor Daniel Crespo. The service is set for 5 p.m. at Rose Hills Memorial Chapel in Whittier. Authorities say 45-year-old Crespo was shot and killed by his wife, Levette, during a family dispute back on September 30th. The case remains under investigation, but so far no charges have been filed. A private funeral service is scheduled for Tuesday. A frightening scene at a Halloween festival in New Hampshire. Two toddlers seriously injured after becoming trapped in a bouncy house that was not tied down. As ABC's Bazi Kanani reports, one of them is in critical condition tonight. What should have been a fun fall festival turned into a nightmare. Two toddlers climbing into this bouncy house while it was in a restricted area, supposed to be off limits. Then a gust of wind. As soon as it went up, it just kind of flipped and came straight down. The bouncy house flying up to 30 feet in the air before crashing down into this New Hampshire apple orchard. A two-year-old boy airlifted with critical injuries. A three-year-old also hospitalized. Oh my God. 
It's a horrifying scenario we've seen before. Two siblings injured when this inflatable slide tumbled 300 feet across a field this summer. Just weeks earlier, two others seriously hurt when this bouncy castle set sail. Tonight, the farm owners say this bouncy house was not ready for use. It wasn't open to the public. It was unfortunate two kids get into it. Experts say it's one more stark reminder that these popular children's attractions must always be secured to the ground and supervised. Bazi Kanani, ABC News, Washington. In Maine, a teenager is dead and two others critically injured after an accident during a Halloween-themed hayride. Police say a 17-year-old girl died from injuries sustained during the crash. The accident happened after a Jeep that was hauling the hay wagon lost control and the wagon careened down a hill, crashing into a tree and flipping over last night. A teen boy and the driver are still in the hospital in critical condition. Twenty other passengers were taken to hospitals for treatment. Police say a mechanical problem may have contributed to that accident. Former Olympic track star Oscar Pistorius returns to a South Africa courtroom tomorrow where his sentencing will begin. Last month, the judge convicted the double amputee runner of negligent killing in the shooting death of his girlfriend, Reva Steenkamp. The sentencing is expected to involve several days of legal argument and testimony. On Valentine's Day last year, Pistorius shot Steenkamp through a closed bathroom door. The sentence can range from no time behind bars and a fine to 15 years in prison. The former captain of a luxury cruise liner that capsized off an Italian island in 2012 claims he did not abandon the ship before the passengers were rescued. Francesco Scatino is on trial on charges of manslaughter, causing the Concordia shipwreck by steering too close to the island and then abandoning ship before everyone else had been safely evacuated. Scatino claims that faulty emergency generators and a poorly trained crew contributed to the tragedy. He also says he did not jump into the water until all the passengers were evacuated. He says there was no other way out of the situation. 32 people were killed in the shipwreck. Coming up on Eyewitness News, we'll introduce you to a very big cat with a very big problem. We will tell you just how much this little guy weighs and what's being, done, <laughs> what's being done to help him get back in tip-top shape. Plus, a brave little boy got his dream come true after putting on a badge and battling the bad guys. We'll explain when we come back. Hi there, I'm Danny Romero, hopefully one of the good guys, and here's a story. Clouds tonight, rain on the way. When does it get here? I'll tell you all that with a seven-day coming up in just a bit.
Move over, Garfield. There's a new fat cat in town. Meet Reggie. The flabby feline that was written in the script, I, I didn't say that, <laughs> brought into, or was brought into Riverside Cat Hospital, weighing a whopping 37 pounds. An average cat is only 8 to 10 pounds. Reggie's weight puts him at risk for diseases like diabetes, and his owner couldn't afford his care, so the vet there adopted him and plans to document his weight loss journey on Riverside Cat Hospital's Facebook page. His new mom says Reggie's the heaviest cat she's seen in her 10-year Career. Well, maybe don't feed Reggie lasagna every day. <laughs> well, that was that was just Garfield. That wasn't Reggie. Okay, I'm so. I'm sorry. I'll have to check my script. Uh, a brave little boy is probably still over the moon after donning a badge and battling the bad guys. Thanks to Utah law enforcement officers and the Make a Wish Foundation, the five-year-old leukemia survivor had an unforgettable day. Reporter Brian Carlson brings us his story. <laughs> Dreams are coming true today for five-year-old Lucas Aguilar of Orem. Say hello to our newest police officer. <laughs> Lucas wants to be a police officer. So today, Salt Lake police are swearing him in and putting him to work. We know that Iron Man was somewhere in Salt Lake City today, and he's gone missing. Your job, you're going to take control of a search for him. Lucas is a Make-A-Wish Utah kid. Last year, he was diagnosed with leukemia and has two more years of chemotherapy. It's very hard to, to know that there's nothing you can do for yourself when he's hurting, um, the medication, the chemo. So to help ease his pain, Salt Lake City and other agencies are granting his wish. This is one of the better days for the police chief, and so the opportunity to participate with members of our community to actually meet with a young person who has some excitement about being a law enforcement officer. He's training with the SWAT team, the canine unit. <laughs> Even shooting an automatic airsoft gun and a Smurf bullet. <laughs> All to save a superhero in need. The Department of Public Safety flew him in to the last place Iron Man was spotted, at Hogel Zoo. Lucas is getting the thrill of a lifetime. His family tells me he loves police officers, is a big fan of superheroes, and the best is yet to come. Lucas searched the zoo, recruited the help of a few superhero friends, and was hot on the trail. He found Iron Man, batteries depleted, and gave him the boost he needed. Lucas knew exactly he had saved the day. I saved the Iron Man. Governor Herbert was so proud he made an official proclamation. Hereby declare October 11th of 2014 as Lucas Aguilar Superhero Day in Utah. And I so sorry. For Lucas and his family, it really is a wish come true. To have strangers just just open their, their hearts, uh, their families, um, and show their love and, and friendship for our family. I mean, um, it, it humbles me. This is what Make-A-Wish is all about because we're seeing a, a child that's gone through a lot of medical issues and, and we're seeing him grant something. He can forget about his medical issues today. And today, those issues are the last thing on Lucas's mind. Me. You are? Yes. I am police. How does that feel? Uh, I am the boss. <laughs> <laughs> he sure is. That was Brian Carlson reporting. Lucas's parents said they were grateful for a little fun during such a trying time in his life. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Mm. Actress Bella Thorne shakes off her sweet side. Still to come on Eyewitness News, we talk to the young star about her latest role as a rather demanding girlfriend. And a battle for supremacy in the NFC as Dallas travels to Seattle. Highlights from the Pacific Northwest ahead in Sports with Kirk.
Welcome back. Time to talk about our weather. It's been really fantastic. Yeah, really nice. I and love it. You, now, you like the warmer weather, too, well, don't you? Yes, but it wasn't scorching. True. It's comfortable, okay. yeah. Another non-scorching, <laughs> warm day. Well, Danny, I like rain. To keep can her we, happy. Can we get something for me, too? Do you notice on here, who do you think we want to keep happy with? <laughs> yeah. No offense, but... Let's go with warm. Smart yeah. man. Right Danny here. Romero. There you go. So, Although, I, I like yes. the rain. We need it, too. Yeah, we, we do. We need the rain. Yeah. So, my gosh. I can't make her not happy when I have <laughs> sunshine and warm tomorrow, then chance of rain after that. I'll show you all that coming up here. First, to go outside. Uh, one thing I want to talk about is there is a, a little advisor that just went up a little while ago, so I want to mention that to you. Up around the Ventura County coastal areas, uh, the area you see, like kind of that purple color, uh, this we're talking about is a high surf advisor. It's in effect uh, till Monday afternoon at 3 p.m. We're looking at some seven to eight foot sets, some spot, spots getting up to nine or ten foot sets. Be careful there in those, uh, in those hours from uh, tonight till tomorrow afternoon at 3 p.m. for that Ventura County coastal spot. Now, swing the camera over to another part of the coast. How about LAX? And we're looking at HD. A lot of cloud cover here. The beach area is going to get stocked in tonight into tomorrow morning. And take a little while to clear tomorrow, but when that does, pretty warm day on the beach areas. Downtown sky is pretty nice. 69 degrees our temp. A little breeze at 3 miles per hour. Relative humidity at 78%. Here's the marine layer I'm talking about. We showed you LAX. Watch how the clouds are going to move in on the coast. And to some of the valleys tomorrow morning, see that Monday morning, back off Monday afternoon. Monday night into Tuesday, we'll see those clouds return once again, the marine layer, on the coast to the valleys as well. But gone by the afternoon to warm things up quite nicely, thank you very much. This high-pressure ridge that's in place now has given us a stronger offshore flow, so it pushes that marine layer out pretty quick in the day. That's going to break down right about Tuesday, Wednesday. When that happens, we're going to see a trough of low pressure drop in now. See the circulation around that is in that uh, counterclockwise motion that pushes all that cool air onshore and keeps it farther inshore uh, on land, bringing some cooler temps to everybody and with those clouds and moisture, a chance of rain. Making Giovanna happy for three days this week. We like that. Here we are, numbers overnight, 50s and 60s. That colder spot, Lancaster 48. Then tomorrow, as mentioned, the heat on the inland spots, 90s for Santa Clarita and Northridge. Malibu clears out, goes to 81 in the afternoon, 79 for Huntington Beach as well, and we'll see Wrightwood getting to 86. Uh, San Bernardino to 92 tomorrow. Pretty nice. Here's the seven day power vacuum weather, giving you clouds, the beaches uh, in the morning, and then warmer in the afternoon. Look at almost 90 degrees downtown, but then look at the temps drop down to the 70s Tuesday, Wednesday, with that influx of the cool, moist air and that chance of showers on Wednesday. Then by Thursday, Friday into the weekend, Right about average temps, morning clouds, afternoon sunshine is the pattern setting up. We see a hot day for valleys on Monday, and then cooling down with a chance of showers on Wednesday, and then into the weekend, lower 80s, below average temps there. Mountain areas will be sunny and clear, a little on the windy side Tuesday, cool through the week, cold at night, and the high desert will have some gusty winds there as well. And the temps are warm-ish, 86 to 83, and then drop into the 70s in the desert for Wednesday and Thursday, and then by the weekend, back up to the low 80s with some windy conditions going on. You happy? Sure. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> then we're happy. You always make us happy. We try right? our best. How about you, Kurt? You happy? I'm fine. I'm not a Dodger or Angel fan, yeah, yes. but uh, there are other Dodger fans that their worst nightmare after being eliminated could be coming true. The Giants, could you imagine them advancing to the World Series? After winning Game 1 of the NLCS last night, right now they're tied 4-4 in the ninth inning. And get this, the Giants scored on a wild pitch with two outs from second base to tie it. We'll show you those complete highlights on Eyewitness News at 11 o'clock. Meantime, Pete Carroll, the defending Super Bowl champs, taking on Dallas just before the half, not at its head. Tony Romo with the all-day to throw, and he finally does. He hits Jason Witten. As it turns out, the Seahawks have got a pretty good quarterback. Case in point, Russell Wilson, great athlete. And with that, he catches the corner, and wow, what a game. Turns out the uh, Cowboys have the best running back in the league. DeMarco Murray, six straight games of over 100 yards. That's a 15-yard touchdown. And how about those Cowboys? 18 years removed from the Super Bowl. They are 5-1. and one. They've won five straight, knocking off the Super Bowl champ, 30-23. to 23. In the meantime, Packers quarterback Aaron Rodgers looking for his first win ever in the state of Florida. Tied 10-10. He eludes some uh, pass rushers by some time. And look who he finds in the end zone, Randall Cobb. That's pretty. But Miami rallied behind Ryan Tannehill, Tannenhill, excuse me, who traded two first-half picks for a couple of touchdowns. That makes it 24-17 to Mike Wallace. But what a finish. Six seconds left. Rodgers, a quick corner connection. Ball game. His third touchdown pass of the game, and the Packers take it 
27-24. Peyton Manning started the day five touchdowns shy of Brett Favre's all-time record. And on the same field where they were blown out in the Super Bowl, he throws three touchdowns to the Thomas family, two going to Julius, the other one to Demarius. You have all those guys, Rory, right? As it turns out, he had a good fantasy day, and I'll tell you, the Bronco defense pretty good down the stretch. This proved to be the dagger from Geno Smith, the pick six. Denver improves to 4-1, and one, sending the Jets to 1-5. and five. Floyd Mayweather, with that pick, won $600,000 for covering the spread. In Oakland, the Blue Angels, like the Chargers this season, flying high. First quarter, Silver and Black had their own flight plans. Derek Carr finds Andre Holmes. And check it out. Dude goes 77 yards for a 7 nothing lead. Carr threw four touchdowns on the day. Raiders needed a field goal. They need about 15 yards to get into field goal range. And when you haven't won a game, I guess you're going for the win. As it turns out, pick. New coach for the Raiders, same old story. They've now lost 10 straight, 31-28. Landon Donovan back in the Galaxy lineup taking on FC Dallas. 22 minutes in. Guy C. Zardes with a cross, but it's deflected out of the box. But Stefan Ishizaki brings it down, chips it over the goalie. And as it turns out, there's a game winner from FC Dallas as they take it 2 1 the final. Wong just homered for the St. Louis Cardinals. Cole they Wong are, does it again. That kid's incredible. <laughs> it's that series tied 1 1 going hmm. back to San Francisco. That's a good okay, game. Kurt. Thank you. Ahead on Eyewitness News, we'll tell you what topped the box office this weekend. And we talked to actress Bella Thorne about her new role. She trades in her sweet side for something a little more demanding. Let's see what she has to say when we come back.
Alexander and the Terrible, Horrible, No Good, Very Bad Day opened in theaters this weekend. It's based on the popular children's book from 1972. Actress Bella Thorne takes on a role that shows she's not afraid to shake off her sweet side. Entertainment guru George Pinocchio explains. Is everything okay? Your last text was like so cold. No, sir. See you at school? Uh, yeah, I'm your girlfriend, Anthony. You really should end your text with XOXO or I heart you. You can make a heart with a less than sign and a three. Bella Thorne plays one pretty demanding girlfriend in Alexander and the Terrible, Horrible, No Good, Very Bad Day. Some might call her a witch. Give her take a letter. And that's a far cry from the sweet girls she's played in the past, including her starring role on the Disney Channel's Shake It Up. In this movie, Bella insists her attitude doesn't necessarily make her mean. If you say, see you at school, period, well, does, does that mean you don't want to send me a good morning text? Does that mean you don't want to talk to me before school? Does that mean you'll just see me in class? You don't need to see me after? Like, what does that mean? Now, if you put a heart or you put a kissy face, or you put a good emoji, then it's like, okay, baby. So, a bunch of the girls are talking, and they're all going in limos. We are getting a limo tomorrow, right? I just think people miss, you know, understand her, and, and I, I, I don't want that, because she's a, she's, a, she's a regular teenage girl. What? And so is Bella, who has a message for young women everywhere. More girls should take a lesson from Celia, because she's demanding. And you should be more demanding. If you're dating a boy and you want flowers sent to you the next morning after you go on a date, he should send them. If he doesn't and you tell him to and he doesn't do it, then not good enough for you. If you want something, you deserve to have it. Thorne hopes her character empowers girls to ask for what they want and deserve. So what about Bella? Boyfriend? No, we, we broke up. We were together almost three years. Okay, so you're free. Yeah, he learned. You're, you're, you're ready. <laughs> He's large. He, he, we, I definitely taught him a little something, something. Alexander and the Terrible, Horrible, No Good, Very Bad Day is rated PG. George Pinocchio, ABC 7 Eyewitness News. A little something, something. Mm -hmm. Gone Girl stayed put at the top of the box office this weekend. As you all know, my wife, Amy Elliott Dunn, disappeared three days ago. I had nothing to do with the disappearance of my wife. The Fox thriller starring Ben Affleck earned an estimated $26.8 million. It opened as number one last weekend. Dracula Untold opened in second place with $23.5 million. Alexander and the Terrible, Horrible, No Good, Very Bad Day. Annabelle and the Judge rounded out the top five. And we are out of time. Thanks for joining us for Eyewitness News at 8 here on LA 56. We'll see you on 87 and 11. Good night.